Okay, we've got a good one here from Caltech, Math Me 2025, Finals 24. We have the integral from minus four to four, e absolute value x, fractional part of x, dx. Okay, at first I was thinking about the bounds. You know, whenever you have symmetric bounds, you're thinking even or odd functions. We do have an even function right here because the absolute value takes care of any minus sign. But this function's not even or odd because of the fractional part, so we just need to kind of keep going and look at it a different way, I think. One thing we can do is, in order to deal with absolute value, we can break this up into two integrals. So I can just split it up, getting all the negative values. So go from minus four to zero of this same thing here. When we do it, now all the x values are negative. So all I need to do is change the sign on it and drop the absolute value. So I can write it as minus x here and then the rest of it's gonna be the same stuff. And then for our other integral, we need the rest of the bounds, so we're going from zero to four. But now from zero to four, we know all the x values are positive, so we can just drop absolute value here and do e to the x fractional part of x. But here I'm thinking both these integrals are really similar. Maybe we can get them to be the same or close to the same. I can do a u substitution, the problem we have is so we can change the sign on this. So if I do u equals negative x for a u sub, then of course x is minus u and dx is minus du. So when I do it, the upper bound still is zero. The sign gets changed here. So this becomes a four. This is gonna become now just e to the u. We have to change the sign inside the fractional parts. This becomes minus u and then on the du, let's take the minus sign. We bring it out front. I'm just gonna to use to flip the bounds around. So we're gonna put this back. So it's going from zero to four. So now we've got the same bounds and we've got basically the same thing here. One other thing I can do is just change the variable on a definite integral. We're allowed to change it. So we'll do this, get it to X just so we can work with this other one. And I'll bring this one down so just so we can look at it so we can see it side by side. And now with the same balance, what I'll do is we'll bring it together, create one integral. And when we do it, we've got e to the x in common, right? So we got, we're got we going from zero to four, factor out the e to the x, and create something in parentheses. I'll like reorder it. That doesn't matter how I order it. Let's just do it though. So we'll do fractional part x plus fractional part minus x dx. But here's the key to the whole problem. This thing right here, this thing's gonna have a value of exactly one. You might be worried about the case when x is an integer, right? If x is an integer, the fractional part's gonna be zero. Let's take a quick look at it. So like, what I'm saying is, let's take two as an example. When x is two, the fractional part, there is no fractional part, it's zero. The same thing with minus two, that's gonna be zero. The reason we don't care about this is because with an integral, those are just points in this range from zero to two. They're not gonna have any width, they're not gonna affect the area, and they're gonna be zero area anyway. So this is not gonna affect it. We can essentially ignore that, consider this always one. Now the reason this is always one for a non-integer, we'll come back to it in a minute, but I will show a quick example, like instead of two, if we have 2.3 for our x value, the fractional part of that is 0 0.3. If we, the negative x is gonna be minus 2.3, the way the fractional part works, or the way it's usually defined, and the way they defined it here, by the way, is to round it down, to think about rounding down to th minus three. So this value would be 0 0.7. And then adding those two values, you get one. So we'll come back to that at the end, but let's keep going and finish the problem off because because what happens is now this is a very simple integral because we're just integrating e to the x. So we do it, we get e to the x evaluated from zero to four. And for my final solution on it, we just get e to the fourth minus one, and that's it. Okay, so getting back to the identity, I just didn't want to hold up the whole solution just for this, but let's show this out and show why this is always one when x is a non-integer. Okay, so back to this, showing that this is always gonna be equal to one when x is not an integer. I didn't really show it, I just did an example that when x is an integer, it's clearly gonna be zero, so we're not worried about that case. We also have this definition over here for the fractional part that we can reduce it like this and write it as x 
minus the floor function. Again, using like that example that we did before, if we did the fractional part 2.3, you take 2.3 minus the floor of 2.3. This gets rounded down to two and we're left with 0 0.3. Now for this, what I wanna do is create something what we can do is set x equal to, say, n plus f, where n will be a member of the integers. And we'll define f, some fractional part. To do that, we'll just say it's a value between 0 and 1, not equal to 0 or 1, but between 0 and 1. So all we need to do is take that definition and plug it in. So we have here, this is going to become n plus f plus fractional part, distribute the minus sign into this, we get minus n minus f here. But this right here is just gonna be f based on the definition of the fractional part that's just gonna return that and leave the integer value. So this just becomes f. For this one, we can use this definition right here. So first for like the x part, we plug in the whole thing. Let me get rid of the minus sign. So what happens is we get back minus n minus f, then minus the floor function of this whole thing right here. But then we can cancel off the f's and we have left minus n. Now here, again, using the definition of the floor function, if you think this part is an integer and we reduce it by some part that's less than one between zero and one, then what happens is this whole thing here, we can just write the, express this as minus n minus one, rounding it down. This is always gonna be true as long as f isn't zero, but f can't be zero. But then distribute the minus sign in here, we get minus n plus n plus one. The n's cancel and what we're left with is just one. So this is always gonna work, again, as long as x is a non-integer. Now one note on this, sometimes you will see an alternative definition of the fractional part. I don't know how common it is, I have no idea. I just know that sometimes it's stated that this is only true when x is greater than zero. But this is the pro the solution is the same thing that they had in the answer key. So I'm pretty sure that they're considering the definition where this doesn't matter and we're just using this for all values. But for this problem, there was no conditions on it. So this is gonna apply for all values of x. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks everyone for watching. Have a good day.